tonight we are very delighted to welcome this evening's speaker, Eileen Budd. Uh, Eileen is a writer, artist and museum professional uh, based in the Angus Glens. And tonight she's going to be talking about her book, Ossian Warrior Poet, which will be out later in the year with um, Wide Open Seas Press. Um, Ossian Warrior Poet is a new illustrated edition of James Macpherson's Poems of Ossian from the 1760s. Um, it features location maps and full colour illustrations, an updated text of Macpherson's work. And the aim of this is to bring these ancient legends to a modern audience, to, to, to update these tales for the contemporary world. And we're absolutely delighted that one of Eileen's illustrations from the book Ossian's Warrior Poet will feature in the new museum exhibition. It actually is underneath, we have a copy of this portrait here by David Martin in the new museum exhibition. And one of Eileen's illustrations is just underneath it. So James Macpherson, he's a really important part of our redesign of the museum. Um, he's one of the most significant of all clan members. He's someone who really did change the world, uh, especially in terms of how he inspires this worldwide movement uh, of romanticism. And throughout the museum, James Macpherson features uh, at the very heart of this. Um, and we have lots of lovely books by James, got a lovely pile here of various first editions of Ossian, which feature in the museum. And we're absolutely delighted to be featuring Eileen's work, which demonstrates that the, the, the stories that Macpherson is telling in the 18th century are still part of, of, of living culture today. And that's incredibly exciting. So without further ado, over to you, Eileen. Thank you. Thank you. Can you can you hear me? Can you see me? <laughs> can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes. Fantastic. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, I'm also really delighted to have uh, have one of the illustrations in the McPherson Museum. It's a real honour, uh, and I'm so excited to to come and visit you guys and see what you've done with the with the collection as well. There's some really exciting objects there. Um, so yes, uh, Ossian Warrior Poet, it's the, a new edition of the poetic stories from 3rd century AD, collected by James McPherson, as you said, 18th century. Um, for those who are not sure, the stories tell the tales of Fingal, who is a warrior king in 3rd century Argyll, and his son Ossian of Kona, which is modern day Glencoe. And he's uh, Ossian is a warrior and a bard, a storyteller, a chronicler. And Ossian is also the main narrator throughout. And he recounts epic adventure stories of honor, love, and victorious battles that either he himself has taken part in or his kin have, Thingol has. And the battles are between the Caledonians and the Picts, the Scandinavians, the Romans, among many, many others. And I really wanted to bring them to a new, a new audience because the stories are hardly known outside of academia. I mean, a really creative warrior people, the Scots. Yet, when you start to hunt for books on your ancient legends, there's very little. You know, fairies and bogles abound, but a lot of these come from the 19th century. And we've been here as a people for millennia. So it's always troubled me. Where's the rest? And when I had my son, I really started thinking about the importance of being familiar with your own legends, culture and history and how that influences your sense of self and your confidence in your identity. And well, as a Scot, I'm very proud of our folklore. We have an awful lot of it, it's hard not to be. Um, but I often feel a wee bit disappointed with it because it feels like it's watered down or, or generalized, or like you're only getting half the story, or worse, it's mixed into this romantic notion. Scotland is a land surrounded in mist, rolling hills devoid of people full of ghosts. Now as a Scot, knowing that the reason the rolling hills are devoid of people is because they were cleared to make way for sheep and deer, and knowing that thousands of battles have taken place on and over our land. And so there's a ghost attached to every hill and glen. And as for the mist, well, 
it's an old it's an old Scottish folk belief that the restless dead ride in the mist and a soul can only find peace when their story has been told. So if our land has been bathed in blood for millennia, well, it's no wonder it's now clothed in mist. All those warriors just waiting for their stories to be told. I mean, we've been around as long as the Vikings, you know, as long as the Scandinavians, and we have a shared history. We're even in their sagas. And they have these beautiful, well-known sagas, and yet we have these wee imps running around. It just doesn't add up. And particularly when you learn that fairies and imps are associated with the dead, and that their homes are these huge mounds, and they travel on the breath of wind like ghosts and always from the west. Are those mounds burial mounds? Are our fairies and imps really just remnants of much, much earlier stories? Now we have a long tradition of storytelling and these stories are strongly connected to our land. And Scotland's landscape is full of place names attached to specific legends and folklore like the Corries of the Orisks and Lurch's Crag, Ossian's Stone. It seems really unfair to me that we live within this legend rich landscape and yet so many of us don't know the stories of the Green Hills and it isn't because we're not interested. So I started searching, when I started writing the, the book, I started researching the specific locations and the possibilities for where the autumn stories could have taken place. And I looked at maps from the first map. I looked at Pliny, Ptolemy, Timothy Pond, just to name a few. Centuries, years, so many years, dating way back before James McPherson was collecting the stories. And I discovered that Fingal and Ossian have been part of our geography, part of our place names for centuries. So that's how I started making up maps. I started making the maps for the books. Uh, for the book to give these battles physical context, especially for fellow Scots like me who love to roam the hills and landscape and just wonder who was there when the land was young. And also just to point out just ever so slightly that it's very hard to make something up centuries before <laughs> you've started writing. So the maps are a vital element in my book especially for engaging the audiences. And another vital element is illustration. So you can have a wee look at <laughs> one of the, or well, have a wee look at a map. I think that's the first one. Oh no, it's not, it's a coin. Yeah, this is Carusius. And the, the extract of the story that I'm gonna tell you, it's about this man. Uh, in the story, he's known as Karos. And this is a wee picture of him. I slipped this into the presentation, I think, a bit late in the day. But um, I'll maybe go back one. <laughs> there you are. Well, we'll get to it. <laughs> yeah, apart from the maps and the history, obviously, which is embedded <laughs> as you can see from the Carusius coin, another vital element is the illustration, because illustration is visual storytelling. And images add another layer and dimension to stories. So it gives you a chance to show things that aren't really mentioned in the text, like clothes and hairstyles, uh, the look and feel of, of the, the action happening, or Fingal's home even, Selma. So, things that become, those kind of things that become instantly relatable in illustrations. And my partner, Max Kant, volunteered, <laughs> maybe wishes he hadn't now, volunteered to work on these with me as a team. And so together, we've started working on a style that was contemporary, with a wee nod to the more classical styles of the illustrators who came before us. The, um, the ancient folk, in the Ossian stories, they're highly cultured. 
you know, they're intelligent people, they're full of life, and we really wanted to portray them as much more dynamic and human than a lot of the classical art that came before. So it was really important that we kind of, uh, we put our own stamp on that. And plus, we, you know, we just didn't have the time to do wonderful <laughs> pre-Raphaelite paintings that perhaps we started off imagining. And lots of things have been informing these drawings. Everything we could get hands on, from Pictish stones helping us with hairstyles, uh, weapons, clothes, uh, to the latest archaeological discoveries and historic research. Finding out that, you know, uh, the Picts were producing books, you know, and writing and it's uh, making beer. It, it all feeds into it. And there's such a huge amount of research that's gone into these these illustrations. And if we were to write it all down, it would be a book in itself. Uh, and it might yet be. <laughs> However, we can present it all instead in the drawings and in the book, uh, which is a special, a special important element to illustration. Um, so I do have two extracts from the book and two stories to tell you. And then uh, I really hope you have some questions for us. I'm very excited to answer any questions that you might have. Um, and I have a map and an illustration to, to go with, with each story. Uh, and the one I want to start with, as you saw, a sneak preview of, is the War of Karos. Yes, there we are. Um, and I have, I do actually have a tiny coin. <laughs> I'll maybe show you guys at the end, actually. Uh, and it's got this chap on it. And it dates from the exact same time as the story is supposed to have taken place. And who knows, it might have even been handled by Oscar and Ossian himself. Who knows? Um, so this chap, Roman Emperor, well, so we wanted to be anyway. <laughs> So yes, woven throughout Austrian stories are fragments of history such as this, the invasion uh, by Rome. Um, but the stories are written from our perspective, from a Scottish perspective, from, uh, from the people receiving the invaders' perspective. And I find that really refreshing because obviously the Romans had such a fantastic written record, but a lot of it was propaganda. Uh, for their for their world back home so there's so much salt that you have to take with it but because historians love written records it's one that's relied on very very heavily um, and I uh, it's always been disappointing to me <laughs> however I chose this story because it has a beautiful lyrical language in it and that is something I've desperately tried to keep in the book is that um, that translation that James did into English to keep that kind of Gallic um, poetic language in it as much as possible, but bringing it up to date so it's not, the translation of it isn't lost. And it also has some very specific real world locations and obviously a direct historical reference in Crucius. And I do obviously like this story because we win, right? <laughs> Spoiler. So, the War of Karos. So, if we have a wee look at the next slide. So, there, a battle map. And right in the corner, right in the neck of Scotland, we have a tiny wee mark. It's a three, it's a wee necklace of three. And it's the far one on the far uh, right beside the fifth or fourth. And this is where we're looking. This is where we are. And it's called the War of Chaos. It's 286 AD. The Roman commander, Carusius, Caros, if you remember in this poem, he's defeated the emperor in several naval battles, and then he proclaims himself the new emperor, and specifically the emperor of the north, meaning Britain, really. And Carusius returns to Britain to repair Agricola's wall. However, Carusius, Caros, Caros's ship is blown up the Firth of Forth in a storm and he lands very close to Falkirk. Uh, Camelot, 
in fact, near there, when he hastily builds a defence against local Caledonians, who, let's face it, they're less than happy that he's there. And the leader of the Caledonian army at this time is Oscar, Ossian's son, Fingal's grandson. And Oscar invites Caros to battle, and Caros accepts. And as per ancient tradition, the night before battle, Oscar climbs a hill to consult the ghosts of his forefathers. Now, because the ghosts of our ancestors are in the mists all around us all the time, Oscar's great-great-grandfather, Trenmore, arrives out of the gloom to advise him on his battle. And we get a wee illustration of that on the next slide. Hopefully, there we are. That's my, that's our um, imagining of it. So that's Os uh, Oscar on the horse there and his great-great-grandfather, the ghost of Trenmore on the left there, with his big spear. <laughs> and Trenmore arrives at the gloom to advise him on his battle. And Trenmore also, at this point, tells Oscar far more than he ever wants to hear. And it does change him from this point on. So, Oscar passed the night among his fathers and grey morning mist met him on Karen's banks. A green veil surrounded the tomb which had arisen in times of old. Little hills lifted their heads at a distance and stretched their old trees to the wind. The warriors of Karos sat there for they had passed the stream by night and they appeared like the trunks of aged pines to the pale light of the morning. Oscar stood at the tomb and three times raised his terrible voice. The rocking hills echoed round and the starting rose bounded away and the trembling ghosts of the dead fled shrieking in their clouds. So terrible was the voice of my son when he called his friends. A thousand spears bristled round the people of Karos rose. My son, though alone, was brave. Oscar was like a beam of the sky. He turned around and the people fell. His hand was the arm of a ghost, stretched from a cloud to slaughter all before him in the veil, while the rest of his form remained unseen. My son saw the approach of the foe. He stood in the silent darkness of his strength. Am I alone, said Oscar, in the midst of a thousand foes? Many spears there. Shall I fly to Artham? My father's never fled. The mark of their arm is in a thousand battles, and Oscar too shall be renowned. Come, you dim ghosts of my fathers, and see my deeds in war. I may fall, but I will be renowned like the race of the echoing Morven. And he stood growing in his place like a flood in the narrow veil. The battle came, but they fell. Bloody was the sword of Oscar. The noise reached his people at Krona and they came like a hundred streams. Battles spread from wing to wing. 10,000 swords gleamed at once in the sky. The warriors of Karos fled. Oscar remained like a rock left by the ebbing sea, now dark and deep with all his steeds. Karos rolled his might along, the little streams lost in his course and the earth rocking round. So they won. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I love this story. Um, because because of the language in it, and obviously because we won as well. Um, and I also think it's, uh, you know, the original text talks a lot about the, the banks of the Caron River. So it's very, it's very specific. And there's, interestingly, there is a major archeological site near that spot in, in Camelon where Roman pottery, weaponry, bulkheads, and even an oven has been found. Um, yeah, so this is why, it's another reason why I think it's very important that we know our own legends. Um, <laughs> 
because it, obviously you can't take it all as fact, but our legends came from somewhere. And there is a point when legends and history align, and that point is one that is fascinating to me and inspirational as an artist and a writer. So there. <laughs> so that's the first one. <laughs> uh the second one so we could have a look at the the second map so this is the the territories of alpha uh map and uh you can see it involves uh we haven't put the islands at the side in a square box uh, we did stretch it out <laughs> to make sure they were all included uh, this battle takes place in Innistor, which is uh, or well Orkney, near Orkney. Just uh, it's Hoy, I think, is the specific point, but uh, you can just see Innistor very ship. So, um, now I really love this story because there's a lot of humour in it, and uh, and that's one of the interesting things about these legends is is that it. It really does bring to the fore that we weren't, you know, the, the people of that time were not savages, you know, it was a highly cultured, highly intelligent uh, people, cultured people. So uh, I thought I would read this one because it's, it's uh, when I read it, and every time I read it, it's, it's, it's sort of funny to me. Um, it's called uh, Karakthura. Karakthura, a poem. And Karakthura is uh, a settlement in Orkney, so it's, it's somebody's home. And this story is about Fingal's younger days, so he's uh, you know, a uh, virile Scottish warrior, uh, which is always fun to draw. Uh, and Fingal is returning from a victorious battle against the Romans. <laughs> Though sadly, it was a battle in one which his betrothed Kamala had been killed. Now Kamala was a princess from Orkney in his store, and her home was Karakthura. So, because Fingal has just won this amazing battle, a huge victory feast is laid out. And at this victory feast, Fingal decides to go and visit Kamala's home in Orkney, in a store, and share her brother Sarno, share his grief at Kamala's loss at their family home, Karakthura. So, but yet again, a storm arises, just those troublesome storms when he's at sea and he's unable to reach in a store. And Fingal's ship is forced to move in another bay, but it is just within sight of Karakthura. And from this bay, he can see that the tower has lit a distress beacon and Karakthura is under attack. You know, night falls and Fingal's army tries to get some rest. But Fingal can't rest and he decides to climb a hill to get a better view of the tower and just really torture himself properly. So while on the hill, he meets with the Scandinavian attacker's god, as you do, Loda. But you can substitute the word Loda for Odin because that's basically who he is. Now, the Scandinavian attackers in the book, they always seem to bring Loda with them <laughs> wherever they go. Uh, and Loda is no stranger to Fingal and he's an old and very unusual adversary and they have a very odd relationship. So here we go. <laughs> we set up camp. Three large oaks worth of firewood fed our campfire. A feast was laid around it, but Fingal's soul was distracted by the distress of Kalakthura's chief. The cold moon rose in the east and sleep descended on the youths. Their blue helmets glittered to the beam, the fading fire decayed. But sleep did not rest on the king. He rose in his armour and slowly ascended the hill to see the flame of Sarno's tower. 
The flame was dim and distant. The moon hid her face in the east. A blast came from the mountain and on its wings was the spirit of Luda. He came to this place in terror. He shook his dusky speed at Fingo. His eyes appeared like flames in his dark face and his voice was like distant thunder. Fingal advanced his spear in might and raised his voice on high. Son of night, you tire. Call your winds and fly. Why do you come to my presence with your shadowy arms? Do I fear your gloomy form, spirit of dismal Loda? Your cloud shield is weak. Your misty sword is feeble. The ocean's blast rolls them together and you are lost. Go home, son of the night. You have no power here. Do you force me from my place? Replied the hollow voice. The people bend before me. I turn the battle in the field of the brave. Fingal bent down to remove a stone from his boot and tried to shake it out as Loda rose in a giant red angry cloud around him, his voice getting louder and louder the more he was ignored. I look on the nations and they vanish. My nostrils pour the blast of death. I come on the winds, the tempests are before my face. Though my house is calm above the clouds and the fields of my rest are pleasant. Bingo, having removed the storm, stood up straight and shrugged before replying, well, then go back and live in your pleasant fields. Forget Calmo's son. Do my steps ascend into your hills, into your peaceful plains? Do I meet you with a spear on your cloud, spirit of dismal Loda? Why then do you frown on me? Why shake your airy spear? You frown in vain. I never fled from the mighty in war. And the King of Morven is not frightened by wind. And at this, the fire in Loda's eyes grew and when he spoke, his voice shook the ground with its force. Go home, replied the form. Take the wind and fly. The blasts are in the hollow of my hand. The course of the storm is mine. The king of Sora is my son. He bends at the stone of my power. His battle is around Karakthura, and he will win. Go home, son of Komo, or feel my flaming wrath. He lifted high his shadowy spear and he bent forward in his dreadful height, rolling towards Fingal like a red sandstorm, screaming in rage as he went. And Fingal drew his sword, the blade of dark brown Luno, the gleaming path of the steel wound through the gloomy ghost and Fingal wafted him away like a column of smoke as it rises from a half extinguished furnace. Spirit of Loda shrieked and rolled into himself. He rose on the wind. Innistor shook at the sound which hit the waves and stopped their course. Briefly, the men on shore started at once and took up their heavy spears. Where was the king? They rose in rage, all their arms resounding. The moon appeared from behind the clouds in the east. Fingo returned to his camp, his armor gleaming in the moonlight. The joy of the young warriors was great and their souls settled like heavy seas after a storm. Ulla and the bard raised the song of gladness. The hills of Innistor rejoiced and more wood was added to the campfire and tales of heroes were told. Meanwhile, Frotho, Sora's wrathful king, sat brooding beneath the tree. His army spread around Karak Thura and he looked at the walls with rage, longing to spill blood. And if you want to find out the rest, you have to read the book. <laughs> there we go. So, yeah, that's the that's the two two extracts I have uh, for you. If we go to the next. <laughs> Thank you. Go to the next picture. So yeah, we had just to tell you about the sort of uh, spirit of Luna. So here we had, uh, you know, we thought about how to portray it. 
and uh, we've got Loda there, the big fire god, and then just pure Raj. And then at the below him, we have Fingo just going aye aye, and he's having a picnic. <laughs> and in the picnic there's obviously there's lots of wonderful little artifacts that are absolutely uh, of the time uh, so yeah there's lots of little interesting things and a wee dog as well uh, one of his hounds so yes um, and then behind Loda is his, his house his peaceful house um, yeah, that's, uh, that story is one of my favourites because it, it gets the, the imagery in it is just uh, incredible and it was so much fun to, to work, <laughs> to work on. Um, so, yes, uh, there's that one. Yeah, I know what I got it. Yeah, so if there's, yeah, I'm going to hand, hand, hand it back to you uh, if there's any questions. I would, uh, yeah, yeah, Fingal's dismissal is, it is, it's funny. <laughs> so, a, yeah. Thank you very much, I, that is absolutely terrific. Uh, what an amazing w w way to, to kick the weekend off in style. It makes me want to, to, to get back and read all these right away now and can't wait until your book comes out. It sounds so exciting. Uh, what a wonderful treat to look forward to towards the end of the year. So thank you very much for that. So, um, questions for Eileen. Um, sorry, um, M M Mara, have you been wrangling the chat? Is there anything in the chat that um, folks would, in terms of questions? I think fo folks have been enjoying the, the, the storytelling, the words, the, the illustration, and, and particular, Eileen, your, your way of telling these stories. And um, <laughs> I, I, I must agree with the, the person who's asking when you're releasing the audio book to go with the, with the actual book, because yeah, it's, I, I've spent, you know, 15 years reading this stuff and hearing it is absolutely fantastic. And I, I, I would echo that. And I, I want an audio book to, to go with the, with the print <laughs> book as well. Um, well but I guess to, to turn it into a, a weak question is, um, when is the book coming out? What's how do people this isn't it's not meant to be a sales talk, but the book <laughs> is exciting. And we, you know, we, 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 do, we do want to facilitate that. So how do people pre order the book when what, what are the plans? What's what what's happening with that? Uh, well, uh, we had plans to release it in summer, uh, but lockdown just kind of stuffed our plans really. So um, we're now looking at uh, November as a release get in before Christmas and I think that's you know we've had a you know, we've had a good think about it and I think that's that's definitely viable um and we're going to try and time it with um James McPherson's birthday so yeah so we'll have a really think about that if you want to pre-order uh, the book you can go to Wide Open Seas uh, website. They have a, a big cartel, it's called, or um, the shopping part of their website, and you can go and you can pre-order it. Um, you can also contact uh, Wide Open Sea or myself if you've any any bother with it at all. Uh, we're more than happy to um, to talk you talk you through it. Um, so yeah, so that's kind of, that's our plans really. Uh, we've only got one more major illustration as a line drawing to finish. And then it's the, the uh, to put it in a pretty uh, crude way, it's the coloring in bit that we've got to do next. <laughs> so <laughs> um, so that, that in itself is gonna take a wee bit of time, but yeah, it's nowhere near as much time as all the research that's gone into it and actually creating the, the characters so so yeah so that's that's yeah i think that's <laughs> Excellent. We, we've put the, the link in, in the chat there for folks to, to, to read about the book and also the, the link to pre-order. And I, I think it's worth saying that it'll be illustrated in, in colour. It's not just not just the line drawings that we've been seeing tonight, but beautiful colour illustrations um, of which the museum ha has a print and they look fantastic in person. They are just wonderful. And when we were thinking about how to how to share this with, with our audience in the museum, 
um, we consciously put it un under James's portrait, so it's at the right height for, for we wants to see and for everyone to get a really good look at it and to get up close and, and personal with, with what's <laughs> happening there. So that's that's something we're, we're, we're really excited about. Um, the, there's a question in the chat um, about uh, whether you used any specific objects for inspiration and whether you'd like to say a bit more about that. Oh my goodness, so many, so many. So um, as a museum person, uh, you know, I've been uh, privileged to have access to these objects for, for many, many years. And it's always been a kind of uh, information gathering exercise for me. You know, when I see something that relates to the, the third century, because, you know, I, I first got into Austin when I was a teenager, you know, so, like it's been like a pet project for you know far longer than I care to admit um so uh, you know and I used to work for uh, National Museum of Scotland they have a wonderful uh, prehistory collection and, and uh, early history collection so there are I mean all the picture stones that you could kind of I could kind of get my hands on uh, or no not in the literal sense but they could go and see so there's uh, up the road for me there's um, Aberlemno so you know we just have to literally drive up the road and have a good look at the uh, the designs and patterns and things which inspired the tattoos on some of our characters as well as the shield patterns um, some of the weaponry although we have to do we do also have to bear in mind that some of the stones are have been carved in the ninth century rather than you know but they depict earlier battles so uh yeah so it was very much kind of looking at the the objects that we have that are super available and, and they're supposed to depict things from that time so the rocks the picture stones uh, and then actual archaeological evidence and not just the stuff that's been found in Scotland as well because they're fighting so many different people so we looked at you know objects that are kept in Rome we looked at objects that are kept in uh, Sweden and Norway and Denmark um, so it was very much kind of uh, piecing a puzzle together to just see you know not just what the, the Caledonians were using or the Irish were using but you know what were the what were the Scandinavians what were they doing you know what were the Romans what what kind of Romans because the Roman um, uniform changes dramatically depending on you know how many countries they've conquered at a certain point in time so it, it's very much kind of thousands <laughs> thousands so we have been talking about uh, my partner and I have been talking about doing uh, a book of uh, like a separate book later, uh, just putting it all together, um, you know, with the pictures of the object, so if we can get permission from all the different museums, I'm sure they'd be okay with it, um, you know, putting together the, the objects that inspired them, the illustration, and then just, just us actually just talking about it, like how we put them together and how we broke it up and where we took things from and what inspired bits and pieces. But there's lots of gaps as well. So you've kind of got to, um, you know, with all these different jigsaw puzzles, sometimes you also have to just go, well, this is between this age and it's between that. Um, so it's, it could be either style and then you sort of have to pick one or the other uh, or you're making hybrids. Um, but we tried as much as possible to to make it um, as historically accurate as possible for that time because you know because there are major historical events that happen in it that, that it's a part of and it's a part of our history that we don't really know much about so having any kind of visual uh, is <laughs> is a win really and I, I think it also helps cement the stories as being you know uh, uh, real and uh, tangible and you know, if there's a thing that you can go and look at, if there's a place you can go and stand, it, it makes it so much more alive. Um, and that's something that I, you know, is very important to me as a, as a museum person, as a history person, as an artist. So uh, yeah, I hope that answers the question. Babbling on. <laughs>
Fabulous. We've got a couple more questions in the chat uh, from Steve. How, how did you choose the stories to include in Ossian Warrior Poet? I chose every single goddamn one of them. And that is why the book <laughs> is over 300 pages. <laughs> uh, I chose them, uh, not leaving any out. The, the ones that uh, are true to Music Fairson's collection, um, those are the ones that uh, they stuck with because those are the ones that inspired me. And I know that a lot of, uh, later collections you know they, they didn't they left out like tomorrow and they left out you know bits and pieces and i didn't want to do that and i have um like a, i have a second edition which i really should have brought down to the kitchen with me um i have a second edition of james mcpherson's uh book so and it's a treasured item to me and i sort of wanted to be true to that because it's the one uh, that randomly that Napoleon used to carry around with him. <laughs> so I don't know, not that I, you know, celebrate Napoleon, but just that I wanted it to be as historically, you know, I just, yeah, I wanted to make this object. I wanted it to be an object. I don't know if that makes sense. So I didn't, I didn't leave anything out. <laughs> Probably unfortunately for, for, uh, for Alice, who had to edit it all. <laughs> Fabulous. And we've got a question from Katie. Um, what part of the research process have you enjoyed most? Uh, please can you tell us more about the coin you mentioned at the beginning? Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, no, I used to work in the metalwork department at the DNA. And so I have kept the coin in a little case because I don't have acid free gloves. And I didn't want anyone <laughs> grassing me up to my whole boss. Uh, but let's see if we can see it. So this was part of, this was the fun thing. And this is one of the fun, most fun things about uh, doing the research is the object because you have a tangible thing that you can kind of go, you know, that was held by a person. Uh, so, oh, right, I'm going to take it out of the table. Uh, so you can see, so I don't know if you can see, you can focus on that. So the, the image is much better that I've put in the presentation. Oh, should have done my nails. Uh, the image is much better in the presentation, try and catch the light. And on the other side, this is the other side, but it's, um, yeah, so it dates from, it dates around the same time that he would have been in Scotland. Oh, we'll try and focus on that. Uh, it dates to around the same time that he would have been in Scotland. So trying to repair that wall, but being uh, scuppered by Oscar. Um, so I think looking at some of the objects, um, annoying lots of museums and asking to see things and uh, having lots of really interesting discussions with people as to uh, you know, weapons and uh, uniforms and the land as well, like actually going to these different places and looking and seeing, um, you know, where they've, in the text sometimes it talks about, you know, burial mounds or it talks about stones that are risen and stuff. And so uh, if, if there's any uh, in that area, I have tried to include them in the, in the footnotes. Um, and I know that some have been included in different footnotes as well. So really getting to know the landscape that these, uh, that these stories were uh, written about and written in was fun as well. I think it's all the kind of, the most fun bit of the research was kind of starting to piece it all together and finding bits and pieces and going, oh, actually that connects to this. <laughs> I think that that was the most, the most exhilarating part of the process. And the most frustrating was, conversely, was uh, desperately trying to make sense of my notes, <laughs> remembering where I'd read something and yeah, where it all was. So um, I find it all exciting, so yeah. <laughs> 
Wonderful, fantastic. Um, a follow-up to that, um, Rona was asking if there's going to be a colouring book as well, which would be great. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and, and Bruce has a great question. What, what is your ambition for Ossian? Do you want him featured on the national curriculum, a museum or a trail set up, lauded as Burns um, or even treated by Marvel to become a global cinema sensation, comic and superhero? Oh, wow. Jeez. Yeah, definitely. Well, you should be. Well, first of all, uh, you know, James McPherson needs to be recognised as being, you know, just as important as the Burns because they did very similar things. You know, they were collecting stories. And the reason why McPherson wasn't recognised in this way is, is, you know, mostly political, you know, it's to do with the timing, um, in my opinion. Uh, what would I like to see? What I really want to see and what I bored the other day was <laughs> I want everyone to know the stories. I want my people, I want Scottish people and people who live in Scotland to know the stories because they're your stories. That's what I want. Um, all the rest of the stuff, definitely. I mean, that would be amazing. Uh, I'd love to see that. But that comes second. The first, first and foremost, I want people to know their legends and I want them to understand how they work with our landscape. That's the that's the biggest thing. And if, yeah, oh my God, if it got into the school curriculum, yeah, fantastic. Happy days, definitely. <laughs> Wonderful, fantastic. Uh, exactly, as you were reading stuff out, I was thinking, Wow, this is this is cinematic. That this has that kind of epic scale to it that would look brilliant on the big screen. So, I'm sure give it another decade or so, and that will be totally in <laughs> being done by Marvel. Um, uh, Ali has written in the um, the chat that the coloring book would be an excellent idea that could enable and empower individuals to research their depth of history and home landscapes. Definitely, absolutely. Yeah, you could do all oh, you could do all sorts of things. Yeah, trails, you know, yeah, colouring in, identifying objects. It'd be great to do some sort of like crossover work with museums where you can kind of go, you know, this object inspired, you know, this drawing or this tattoo and kind of, you know, yeah, that would be I think there's there's that's the thing, it's so rich in information and history and research and um, passion uh, that you could, yeah. There's no end to the things you could you could extract from it and, and do with it. Um, yeah, that would be great. Yeah, doing a yeah a coloring book, which is also kind of uh, fact finding. That would be yeah, I like that idea. <laughs> Excellent, fantastic, cool. Do we have any other questions for Eileen? Anything else that folks would like to ask? Can I can I ask the audience a, a question? This is a quite a, a sort of personal fact finding one. Um, how many of you had heard of Ossian before? How many of you have read any of it? And is is this a familiar thing, or are we all newcomers to this? I'm not quite sure. I, I'm not sure we can do a, a poll, but if if folks can, I don't know, clap or pop something in the chat, I'd be quite intrigued. Um, who who's actually read this uh, out of their own account? Lots of new people. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm 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 not surprised by that because it's as you were saying, it's the the stories they're not well known anymore. Um, I'm not sure Macpherson's prose is always very helpful. It's quite a, it can be quite a difficult thing to get into, quite a difficult thing to, to pick up. It's hard to get modern editions of it even. There's a, a nice one done by Lueff uh, a few years ago. That's quite a pretty book. Um, it's a sort of, it, it, it's not it's not everything. It's it's a it's a condensed one, but at least it's, it's a way into, it's not too expensive. 
but it's it's kind of hard to pick it up and, and know about it and find out more about it. And if you Google it, all you get is, oh, but it's made up. And <laughs> this makes me very angry. And we, we've had conversations about that already. But it's not a it's it's not a terribly it's not a thing that's very easy to get hold of, very easy to to sort of get into. Um, you can buy burns at every Scottish tourist shop. Um, the Aussie you have to go digging for, I think. Yeah, totally. Which is like one of the main driving uh, factors for um, yeah for doing this. You know, it's something that I've been you know well gathering information of for years, but working on for the last uh, like solidly for the last couple of years. Um, yeah, it deserves to be known. I mean, it's a major part of our our, our history and our uh, our legends. You know, and I. I think there's a lot of people who feel that that they're missing, you know. Where is it? Where is this stuff? Um, and it is there. It's just that, yeah, a lot of it has been clouded over by this kind of, oh, it's fake, you know, argument, which is just, you know, it's so boring and so not true. <laughs> you know, if you're, if you're still parroting out a 300 year old opinion, uh, made by somebody who hated everything to do with Scotland. You need to you need to have a word with yourself. <laughs> my opinion, my opinion. Because, uh, you're alluding to Dr. Johnson there and his, his, his tour of Scotland. That that that's basically a a quest of trying to find people who would tell him that that Ossian is all made up and not really finding any of them. No. They all come up with, oh no, <laughs> Granny told me that. Tell him so. Um, one of my I think one of our proudest things of the new museum is not just giving James and Ossian a, a full wall to themselves and, and the poems and putting one of the fragments on the wall so everyone everyone will read it, but also having a, a, a vinyl sticker in, in Gaelic in, in English um, with a, a few lines from the elegy, uh, from the, um, the rant written about Dr. Johnson's visit to Scotland. And we picked the, the most polite bit of the poem. <laughs> there isn't much of it. Um, but I, the, 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 the vinyls arrived yesterday and I really enjoyed looking at it and it, it has a phrase that's something like, may he go back to his badger set and continue being angry. That, that's a sort of paraphrase <laughs> of it and it makes, makes me laugh thinking of it and thinking of visitors like yourself, seeing that and going, oh, look at that, that's, that's exactly where, where we're coming from. <laughs> that's, I'm just chuckling to myself thinking about that. Yeah, or just, yeah, I'm still looking forward to seeing the museum. I think it's, yeah, it's so exciting that you're redoing it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm just thinking that, that the, the process that you're describing, Eileen, of, of, of re rediscovering and reinventing and retelling these stories, it's exactly what James himself was doing in, in, in the 1760s, 1770s. Um, and, and he writes explicitly about this in, in the that the preface is how how important it is to a culture to tell these stories. So I love that mirroring the fact that you're you're doing exactly the same in terms of process as as he was doing in in the, the second half of, of the 18th century. Um, of course, it's 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 disappointing that in a way you're having to engage in that process that we've sort of lost these stories that they're no longer as central to, to the culture as they should be, but. Oh goodness, I think with this book that there is such a wonderful opportunity here for these stories to become shared and become popular and, and people to, to know them again. Um, some lovely uh, comments in the chat about the decision to include maps. Really important to, to give folks that sense of how these stories belong to these places, belong to these places that, that people know and that they're part of that culture, part of the landscape. So it's, it's incredibly exciting to have that connection between people and story and place um, through your work. That's absolutely terrific. Fantastic, great stuff. Do we have any other questions for, for Eileen? Anything else you'd like to ask? L last orders for questions. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Wow. It only 
Sorry, Marika. <laughs> so, um, Eileen, if anyone would like to contact you and ask questions, because often they sort of occur to you afterwards, you know, it's, it's hard to think in, in the moment, but, you know, you lie awake a week later thinking, oh, God, I wish I'd, I'd asked that kind of thing. Um, what's the best way to contact you? Is it going directly or through ourselves? Or um, if, if anyone um, has any questions for the museum and, and, and connected to this, and um, the best email is museum at clan macpherson.org the, the museum at email address, or if you respond to the Eventbrite email that, that sent you reminders, it had a little contact the organizer thing that'll come to me. So I'm happy to, to wrangle and forward things, but is there a way of, of contacting you in a different way, Eileen? Um, well, it, yeah, I'm happy if, if anyone, if if you're comfortable just emailing me directly or contacting me through like I'm on Instagram as at Eileen Bud, uh, just my full name, or you can email me Eileen Bud at G for golf, M for mother, X for X ray dot co dot UK. If you're comfortable emailing me directly, I'm friendly, I promise then please do, because I uh, love nothing more, as Mary knows, to, than to talk about Ossian. So feel free and contact me directly if you have any questions whatsoever. Um, if it's connected with the museum as well, you know, uh, email us both. Uh, and if it's something I can answer, I know Mary can. Uh, so yeah, uh, yeah, so I think that's probably the best, that's probably the best way. I've, I've, always happy to talk about Ossian, all right? <laughs> As my partner will attest. <laughs> that, 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 that's fabulous, absolutely. We, we, as, as you can probably tell, we, we are in a similarly, you know, <laughs> Ossian, <laughs> Macpherson-focused household. Uh, no, nothing wrong with that. So thank you so much, Eileen. Uh, all that remains to say is to remind folks of our next talk on the 7th of August, uh, Rona Ramsey talking about Jamesy, uh, J Jamie McPherson's fiddle even, uh, which we will look forward to tremendously. But thank you, Eileen, once again, a tremendous talk, a brilliant beginning to our new Clan McPherson Museum talks. And thank you everyone very much for coming along and we hope to see you soon. So thank you and bye for now.